Welcome to Autism Knows No Borders. Discover what's possible when people impacted by autism inspire change and build community. Together with the Global Autism Project, here's your host, Rachel Harmon. Hello, everyone. Our guest today is Jeff Snyder. Jeff is an autism self-advocate from Massachusetts. As a public speaker, he is passionate about bringing awareness to special education and employment support. In 2020, Jeff contributed to This is Autism, a book by Jessica Lightwise and Aidan Alman Cooper, in which he gave his account of growing up with autism. Jeff is also a moderator of our Autism Knows No Borders Facebook group. Some of the topics we discuss in today's conversation include neurodiversity in movie characters, dealing with sensory issues, and accommodations during school safety drills. Jeff also offers advice about how to respond to someone experiencing a sensory overload. In this episode, discover what's possible when fiction comes to life. For more information about Jeff, please visit our show notes at autismknowsnoborders.com. We appreciate your time. If you enjoy this podcast and you'd like to support our mission, please take just a few seconds to share it with one person who you think will find value in it too. You can also follow us on Instagram at Autism Podcast, join our Facebook group Autism Knows No Borders, and subscribe to our YouTube channel, Global Autism Project. And now I present you, Jeff Snyder. Hi, Jeff. Welcome to Autism Knows No Borders. Thank you for being here today. Thank you for having me. Could you please briefly introduce yourself? Well, my name is Jeff Snyder. I am an autism and disability self-advocate. I am from Seekonk, Massachusetts, near Providence, Rhode Island. And I was first diagnosed with autism at 21 months old, which was in December of 1990. And I was actually nonverbal until I was four years old. And upon my graduation from uh, the Seacon Public School System, I was the first student with autism to have spent pre-K through grade 12 in the school system without coming from other school districts. And I am also very active on social media. I run a group called Jeff Snyder Disability Self-Advocacy, which has over 560 members. And I also run a page called Jeff Snyder Disability Self-Advocate which has about 1,300 likes. And uh, in addition, I am also a fan fiction writer. And for those of you who don't know who fan fiction is, fan fiction is stories based on movies, cartoons, books, anything based on media or fiction. Also on uh, my profiles are on fanfiction.net and uh, DeviantArt. Great. Yeah. So let's start with your childhood. When did you discover your autism? Well, I didn't know I was diagnosed with autism until 1998 when I was the subject for a for a segment on autism by Nick News. And all my life prior to that, I kind of knew I was different from from other kids around me. I seemingly acted as differently like all the others in Of course, you know, when you're growing up, your brain, especially if you're on the spectrum, doesn't function and you certainly don't really understand the world around you. You're kind of wrapped up in your own bubble. Doctors who examined me initially, I later found out, was they told my folks, you know, Jeff will never amount to anything. He'll be very lucky to have a job or have or make friends or graduate high school. And those kind of barriers were really set up because they expected me to not amount to anything. Then they also said that, you know, Jeff will never live on his own. And it wasn't until I was 25 years old that I ultimately moved out of my house and eventually got my own apartment. So I've been living in this apartment for six years now. So it's been a fairly interesting very interesting journey for me. Mm-hmm. I can imagine along the way, you must have felt like you needed to prove people wrong. 
in a sense, yes. Hmm. So let's go back to that Nick News segment that you were talking about. And just so people who aren't familiar can understand, by Nick News, you mean Nickelodeon News, right? That is correct, yes. Yeah, so how did that come about? I honestly don't know. I had heard Nickelodeon News because I obviously watched Nickelodeon in the 1990s, like a lot of people of my generation. And on Sunday nights, there used to be this news show called Nick News, which was targeted towards kids. And somebody within the network approached the producers and they said, can you come to Seacock? And there's this boy who manages autism and his name is Jeff Snyder. So a news crew came and they kind of filmed me, you know, just going about my normal life. And I used to be a big NASCAR fan and I would always do pretend NASCAR races on my kitchen table. And so they filmed me doing that. And they also filmed, you know, I have an older sister. They kind of filmed her as well. So, and then of course, as soon as the segment aired, I think I was in fourth grade when that happened because I was nine when I was first interviewed, when I was featured. And of course, my principal said, you know, we have a student who was featured on Nick News. His name is Jeff Snyder. And of course, everybody at my school really you know, congratulate me on it. So that was, that was really my first exposure to my autism diagnosis in that regard. Mm. So what did you understand about it then? Well, for one thing, I was very sensitive to loud noises and then also to anything that pokes or like needles or bees. I mean, I, I mean, I, I'm still afraid of bees at my age now. But then, of course, uh, one thing that I also noticed is that I was a very picky eater. I mean, I would always have a, a separate meal plan for me when we would go to my grandparents' house or my maternal grandmother's apartment. I wouldn't eat vegetables. I wouldn't eat those kind of things. I mean, I dairy dairy products, I mean, I didn't drink milk. Let's get that right. I mean, I, I didn't drink milk. I don't know if it was the texture or the taste or whatnot. As I've gotten older, I've kind of outgrown that picky eating. So I think a lot of families will notice if their child is being a picky eater, it's good to try new things, but it's not good to force. If a child is a picky eater, you got to take the appropriate steps, but don't be forceful. That's one thing that I've, that I've come to expect from my perspective. Yeah, I can imagine that it would be really could be even painful in a way if yeah. you're trying to force something aversive into someone's mouth. Mm -hmm. And especially going to the dentist and stuff, that can also be a challenge. Mm. Yeah, we know that sensory overload experiences don't end at childhood. So how do your sensory issues impact your life today? I would say probably as I've gotten older, I've become more aware of what my sensory related issues are. And I think for someone that has grown up on the spectrum, as you've gotten older, you tend to get a better understanding with your surroundings and stuff. And the big sensory thing for me is loud noises. And I've started wearing headphones out in public because there are some things that I can't understand with the noise around me. So that's one example. Could you explain what that might feel like when something is too loud for you? What's going on in your body? Well, for one thing that I sometimes, you know, will stand there and just, you know, freeze and not move, that, that would be one example. And then I would always put my hands over my ears to kind of block out the noise, which a lot of people with sensory related issues will do. So that's, that's one example. So you're managing your sensory issues by controlling your environment, like putting on headphones and maybe anticipating when you're going to be going somewhere that it's going to be loud. Yes, yes. I always try to prepare myself, not just for like, you know, going out in public, but and going to loud noise events and stuff like, you know, sporting events or large gathering settings. I always carry headphones. When I have to be social, I will take a headphone out, like an earbud out, not to totally be rude, just be kind of 50-50 in a way. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
And so, Jeff, you said that you live alone. How did you prepare for independent living? One thing that I do struggle with, like a lot of people on the spectrum, is executive functioning. Like I struggle with doing my laundry sometimes. I also had to practice, you know, like loading the dishwasher, emptying the dishwasher, doing laundry, making sure that, you know, I make my own meals. And it really started from when I was in middle school that I really started to kind of and hone in on the on the skills that I've come to harness. So did your parents help? You with that or were you taking some special classes? My folks helped me out with that. Yes. They kind of taught me what kind of basic skills needed to be uh, taught to me. Mm -hmm. What do you like about living alone? Uh, well, it's, it's kind of like my own sanctuary or like my own personal man cave Mm -hmm. that I have the independence to just, you know, go by my own schedule and not have to put up with anyone, anyone else. And, uh, it's, it's actually much more healthier. It's a more healthier environment. And the best thing about living on your own is that you can create your own environment. You play by your own rules. You play by your own system. And you can control your life with living on your own. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, that's great. And do you have a job? Yes, I do. My first job was with Borders Bookstores. I was a bookseller. And uh, during the holidays, for two out of my three years there, I was a greeter, which around that time, I was not really aware of my sensory-related issues fully. And then after I left Borders, I went to Stop and Shop, and I'm still there to this day, although I am trying to look for a better fit that can harness my strengths and uh, talents. At Stop and Shop, I was a bagger, and now I am a janitorial specialist, otherwise known as a porter. And now I'm in the process of seeking out uh, data entry. And really, the other the other main goal is to find a job that will allow me to run my advocacy and uh, allow me to do what I do. Yeah, we'll definitely talk about your advocacy work later on. So what are some of your strengths related to your autism? Well, one of my one of my greatest strengths is that I am very knowledgeable. I do a lot of, you know, studying on my on the internet and I own a lot of Disney movies, so if you ask me anything about Disney or anything like that, I I would be very known about it. The only downside is that because I'm knowledgeable, a lot of people will come to me and they'll ask me like 10,000 questions and I I don't like to be asked 10,000 questions. I mean, I get that, you know, people are trying to be social and stuff, but my brain can only take so much. And that's one thing that I think people still don't really understand about me is that just because I'm smart and knowledgeable, I mean, I can easily get taken advantage of that way. So that is the one downside of being autistic and stuff and uh, having a disability and stuff. So um what do you mean by that, by you can easily be taken advantage of? Well, I mean, just because people think that I can be a walking encyclopedia and have being a walking encyclopedia, you know, people can say, you know, Jeff, can you help me out with this or can you help me out with that? And there are times where I just want to be left alone and other people don't really understand that. So that that's the one downside of being on the spectrum is, is that. Hmm. How do you navigate those situations? I just, you know, do the best I can. I, you know, if they have a question, I'd be happy to answer. If I'm in the mood, I'll be open and honest. But if I'm not up to par, I have to say to people, you know, I just need to back away for a couple minutes or whatnot. So, yeah, that's great that you're setting boundaries. Yeah. I mean, I've recently started to set up like personal boundaries and stuff because. Prior to that, I didn't have a lot of personal boundaries, but as I've gotten older, I've come to kind of set up the boundaries that I need to be a functioning human being. And it helps me become a better individual and it helps me become a better advocate. Yes, definitely. It's so important to advocate for your own needs. Yeah. Okay, Jeff, you've also prepared a couple of presentations related to how neurodiversity can be seen in various cartoon characters. 
Your first presentation is about autism and Disney characters. Tell us about that. Well, the story behind that presentation is that something I've noticed is a lot of people with autism and other disabilities will tend to watch Disney more than anything. And part of that was to just kind of reach out to them on their level. And the goal for this particular presentation was to take several well-known characters that people love and people can relate to and identify traits of autism in those particular characters. Like, for example, Dopey, Dopey from Snow White, he can't talk and a person with autism may not be able to talk and they could only communicate through gestures and movements. And if you take a character like Dopey, you can show that character to an audience of parents and individuals and teachers and caretakers, etc. And they can look at Dopey and say, oh, he's like this person, or he can be like that person. And then also another character I put in is Tigger from Winnie the Pooh, because Tigger doesn't respect personal boundaries. He's always bouncing into Pooh and Piglet and Rabbit. And then, of course, Winnie the Pooh himself, he is very, very gullible. He can believe things that happen as they are. And he's also on a limited diet, hence the picky eating that I mentioned earlier. So those are a few examples of Disney characters that I put into this presentation. I'm, I'm hoping to create a volume two that I could present may, maybe next year or something. But for right now, this is the presentation that will focus on those particular characters. There's nine characters involved, and I'm not going to get into spoilers or anything like that, but it, it's a really good presentation. So, Yes, definitely. I was lucky enough to get a little sneak peek. I don't want to spoil anything, like you said, but I was surprised to see that you were relating some of the characters to family members or people outside of just the person with autism. Yes. Yep. And your second presentation is about Rudolph the Red-Nosed Reindeer. How is neurodiversity represented there? Well, the goal of this particular presentation is to get people to understand that Rudolph is more than just a holiday special that we see once a year around the holidays. Rudolph is about neurodiversity because Rudolph, he's born with a red nose. That's obvious. His father, who's one of Santa's reindeer, tries to cover it up with dirt to pretend like he doesn't have a red nose. I wanted to put that in because there are some parents who will try to hide their child's disability. And that's not right. It's not healthy and it's kind of like masking, if you will, because mm. a lot of pe parents will try to ma mask their children or the children will try to mask themselves. You've got to be open. You've got to just claim yourself out there and let people know you are who you are. And then another character that I put in is Hermie the Elf, because Hermie's kind of the one who has an identity crisis. He wants to be a dentist, but because he's an elf... They think he should just make toys. And unfortunately, a lot of employers will see that in some people with autism or other disabilities because they think because they're disabled, they should be relegated to this particular job, which is true. But what if the individual wants to go beyond what their purpose is? Like people think that, you know, there's an individual who would, who, is a janitor, but people think that he should be a janitor because of his disability. But if the person wants to move up from being a janitor, they should do that. And same thing with Hermie the Elf. He wants to be a dentist. He doesn't want to make toys. And the elves should listen to him. And they don't. And of course, it's not until the end where he looks into the head elf's mouth and says, I better set up an appointment for you a week from Tuesday, 4.30 sharp. That's a good example right there. And then the third example are the Island of Misfit Toys, because the Misfit Toys each have their own unique disability. Like Charlie in the Box is not a Jack in the Box, or there's a cowboy who rides an ostrich, or a spotted elephant, or a train that has square wheels on the caboose. And 
each of the misfit toys does represent someone with a disability that will not be loved. They will not be accepted for who they are. And it's like the character King Moonracer says, there's a quote that he says, a toy is never truly happy until it is loved by a child. Same thing with, with people. I mean, a person is never truly loved until he or she is loved by another person for who they are. And it can happen with not just with employment, but it can also happen within families. If someone wants to pursue a romantic relationship, they would want to be accepted for who they are that way. So Rudolph does represent those kind of traits. And then also Santa Claus in that special represents, he can be kind of ableist, if you will. He thinks Rudolph's nose is annoying or it's going to get in the way of Rudolph being one of Santa's reindeer. So those are the basics that I'm trying to get out there with this particular presentation. Hmm, That's so interesting. I wouldn't have ever thought about making those connections. Mm Mm-hmm. How did you get the idea to put this together? It just happened out of nowhere. I mean, because one of my big talents is I'm a, I'm a gifted public speaker. And combining my, my talent of public speaking with my knowledge of these particular cartoons and movies, and it's, it's a good combination. You can take them anywhere and you can present in front of an audience and you'll get people say, oh, I've never noticed this before or I've never noticed this particular character is like me or like my friends or like my family. The biggest goal is to try to reach out to an audience and say, you know, you're like Rudolph, you're like Dopey, you're like all these characters and you can relate to them in so many ways. Yeah, that's great. It's a really good way to just spread awareness and among children too, because they are actually, you know, the future peers of children with autism now. Absolutely. All right, Jeff. So you're a strong advocate for accommodations at school related to school safety drills. Could you tell us about that? Well, one thing that I, that was really big for me when I was in school was school safety drills, because going back to the sensory related issues with loud noises and stuff and fire drills, as, as important as they are, it was very difficult for me to kind of tolerate. And it was in my IEP that I would be taken out of the building before they would pull the fire alarm. So whenever there was a fire drill, a teacher would come to a classroom that I was in, or if I was with them and they would pull me out of the building and we would be like about 500 feet away and they would pull the alarm and we would watch the entire school be evacuated. So I think the big thing for people with autism that can really struggle with when it comes to fire drills is the element of surprise. I mean, I get that they want to simulate like an actual event, but I think for people with autism, it can be extremely difficult to accept that. Students with autism would like things scheduled because it's part of their routine and stuff, but to like a school principal or a school superintendent, they may not understand that. And they'll say like, you know, oh, he or she's probably trying to chicken out. They just, they don't want to do the drill. Well, they do want to do the drill, but they want to do it in a way that is accommodating to them. So that would be one thing that I'm trying to focus on. I'm trying to make school personnel more aware that these drills, like fire drills, lockdown drills, they can be bothersome. And you have to understand that. Not everyone is going to tolerate that kind of atmosphere or that kind of surprise, if you will. And there needs to be steps involved to help a student deal with the drill, just to kind of be more aware and understanding. That's really the main goal of what I'm doing here. A student with autism who is surprised and kind of thrown off schedule might have a hard time bouncing back and it might affect the rest of their school day and ability to focus. Yeah. I mean, it's, it it can be extremely difficult because again, you know, people with autism crave routine, they crave structure. And some people on the spectrum, if they struggle with their routines being thrown off, it can be like a snowball effect. Mm -hmm. So what are you recommending that school personnel do in those situations? Well, I think school personnel need to get to know the student on the student's level 
and just sit down and say, you know, what about the school safety drills don't you like? Do you not like the noise? Do you not like the chaos? Do you not like the fire, fire, fire personnel actually being there? So that would be something that I would like schools to start doing, you know, just to kind of be aware of the students' struggles with school safety drills and also for lockdown drills. Maybe before the drill starts, same thing with the fire drills, pull the student out of the class and take them to the classroom or take them to a closet or just to prepare them for what's going to happen. A lot of people might often ask about, you know, oh, you're trying to get out of the drill, trying to make things easier for you. Well, it's all about making things comfortable for for the student. And if there's going to be a drill, the student should know about it like maybe two or three days before, maybe even one day. Same with lockdown drills. Bus evacuation drills, I would say probably maybe like one day before, maybe even do a custom drill with the with the bus driver if the student rides the bus and they know the driver personally, do the drill with the driver that the student knows. It's those little things that will make a student feel more comfortable when it comes to doing these kind of drills. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and for students who may be more visual learners, I think using social stories, like showing them pictures, Mm -hmm. whether it's real life pictures or cartoon pictures, and kind of explaining to them what they're going to expect. Yes. As a matter of fact, in my presentations, I put in video clips to give a visual aspect to what I'm trying to get across to people Mm -hmm. and also to show clips that a person with autism might might be thinking of. So yeah, that's really really important to see it from their perspective. Mm-hmm. And I also like that you brought up the need to ask the child what it is about the fire drill or evacuation drill that they don't like. If they're able to articulate that because then you can really get to what the discomfort is and address that instead of assuming that well, they're autistic. They all don't like loud noises or they all don't like being around people. And if you just kind of hone in on what it is that is specific to that student, you'll be better able to address their needs. Yes. And and also some students that are afraid of fire drills, you know, some of them may not talk. They can't talk. And the school personnel might might assume that they can get the information from the student. Well, actually if the student can't talk, if the student has mutism, then they can go to the parents and ask them. So, Switching topics, Jeff, you're also a moderator of our Facebook group, Autism Knows No Borders. And I just want to let our listeners know of the growing community that's available for anyone to join and share stories, ideas, and resources. And we have self-advocates, family members, professionals in the field of autism services, pretty much a good representation of the types of guests and topics that we cover on this podcast. So could you tell us about your role as moderator in that group? Well, as, as a moderator, my responsibility is to kind of look over who is interested in joining the group. I also monitor posts that are not appropriate for the group. And being a moderator allowed me to introduce me to really great people that I've been working with in my advocacy for for quite some time. And that's one of the big that's one of the good things about being a moderator is that it you can talk to people that are kind of on your level, if you will, and who are interested in understanding more about what you do as not just as a moderator, but also as a self advocate. Yes, definitely. And we recently launched Listening Tuesdays in our Autism Knows No Borders Facebook group. Could you explain what the expectations are for those days? For Listening Tuesdays, we want people to listen to others and to respond to what they explain. And other posts are going to be kind of limited for that day. And if you have any questions or anything like that, you could always reach out to me or any of the other co-moderators as well. So, mm-hmm. Yeah, and just to clarify, the people that are allowed to post on Tuesdays 
are people with autism for now. Mm -hmm. We are always going to rotate out, I think, monthly, if I'm correct, the group of people that can post on Tuesdays. So for now, we're opening up the forum to voices of people who identify as autistic or having autism. And everyone can respond to the post by leaving a thumbs up emoji and show that they're supporting that discussion. Mm -hmm. We're just trying to create a safe space for people to really feel like they're being heard. Absolutely. That, that is the goal of what we do at Autism Knows No Borders. I mean, we want people's voices to be heard. And if they have a story that they want to tell, by all means, they should tell it. Yeah. So I encourage our audience to head over to our Facebook group and share their thoughts and insights from listening to our episodes also. I'd love to create and cultivate a safe space to continue these important conversations after the interviews are over. Mm -hmm. And Jeff, you also contributed to a book called This is Autism by Jessica Leichtweiss and Aidan Allman Cooper. So what was that about? It's a book about myself and about 12 other people with autism contributed to this book. And we kind of talked about our lives growing up with autism. And the goal of the book was to just kind of show parents and families and everybody else that we've grown up with autism. And if they're struggling, they can look in the book and they could view our stories and just kind of get a new perspective on growing up on the spectrum. It is on Amazon.com for $19.97. And if you ever want me to sign a copy at a future event, once this pandemic is over, feel free to bring your copy and I'll be happy to sign it for you. Okay, Jeff, I'd like to close with one last question. So speaking from your experience of dealing with different sensory issues, what advice would you give to people who may witness someone experiencing a sensory overload in public? The one piece of advice I would give is to not jump to conclusions. And if someone who's having a sensory overload is struggling, they should not judge that person. Like if the person is going to be having a sensory meltdown, it's important to kind of be there for the person, you know, just say, is everything okay? What's wrong? Do you want me to help you out with anything? It's better to just kind of support the person than just walk away thinking that, oh, he or she is being a brat or anything like that. Because one of the big things that I that really bothers me as someone with autism is seeing a, like a child, particularly an autistic child, having a meltdown and the parent is, is ignoring the person. And a lot of people may often say, why don't you help your child? And the parent would, parent or guardian would say, like, oh, he does this all the time. You know, I'm just ignoring it. And that might rub people the wrong way in that regard. So it's very bothersome to me to see that sort of thing happen. But I think it's important for parents and for others to just to be there for the person and not treat them as like this annoying pest. Because we are not pests. We're human beings and our brains function a lot differently than somebody else's. So all of our minds function differently. And if we're struggling, the last thing we want is to brush our feelings under the rug, especially if someone is having a meltdown. Mm, yeah, definitely. I think it's important to understand why they're having that meltdown and teach them some coping strategies to deal with it so that they can then take care of themselves. Yep. All right, Jeff, thank you so much for sharing your story with us. Thank you. Thank you for having me on. Thanks for tuning in to Autism Knows No Borders. Jeff makes some interesting observations about neurodiversity in movie characters. Identifying autistic traits in relatable characters can help autistic people validate their feelings and, furthermore, promote understanding of what they may be going through. Did any character that Jeff mentioned resonate with you or your experiences? Can you connect any other characters to autism? We'd love to hear your thoughts about this episode. Join the Autism Knows No Borders group on Facebook and share your insights with our community. 
We encourage everyone to engage respectfully in order to move conversations forward and inspire meaningful change. Thanks for listening. Take care. You've been watching Autism Knows No Borders. If you like this video, please give it a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. Also, we'd love to hear from you, so let us know what you think in the comment section. Click here to watch another interview from our podcast. You can also find us on your favorite podcast app. Tune in each week for engaging conversations of how people across the globe are inspiring change and building community. Thanks for watching. Take care.